Welcome to the January Agriculture and Forestry Team Call. Uh, I am very pleased to uh, introduce our speaker. Russell Briggs is a distinguished teaching professor um, and has been teaching soil science courses at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry since 1995. As director of the Forest Soils Analytical Laboratory, Dr. Briggs oversees inorganic chemical analyses of plant tissue and soil samples. He also serves as the director of the Division of Environmental Science at SUNY ESF. Russ is a past chair for the Forest, Range, and Wildland Soils Division of the Soil Science Society of America. Prior to joining the faculty at ESF, he was associate research professor at the University of Maine Cooperative Forestry Research Unit. His research interests include carbon cycling, uh, which is why he's here, uh, in terrestrial systems, and he has co-authored a number of papers on the impacts of different forest management systems on soil carbon. One co-authored paper was mapping carbon accumulation potential from global natural forest regrowth, which was published in the journal Nature. So without further ado, uh, I will turn this over to Russ. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, it's a nice opportunity to get out. And I, I really, what I really miss is these meetings in person are a lot more fun, but uh, here by Zoom, it's a little more convenient, I have to admit. And, and so I'm, I'm just, just pleased to be here. I've, I've, I had an opportunity to watch um, my colleague, Bob Mountainsheimer's presentation. So I, I know you've heard about and talked about and appreciate the role of forests and their role in sequestering soils and, and biomass carbon. So I'm gonna kind of focus today on soils. And, and so, I'll really kind of talk about organic matter, organic carbon, forest soils, and forest management. And um, it's almost like a, a primer, and, and then with some recent research. So I want to say another, I could have retitled this perhaps beyond just scratching the surface. And, and you know, just as forests are, are quite varied, so are soils. And here are two of my, my favorite um, side-by-sides to show the range of variability. Uh, one of those on the left, um, it's uh, out in Washington State at uh, one of our field tours or forest soils field tours uh, decades ago. And this was in a, an, alluvial, an alluvial area, which is beautiful, deep, limitless soil, it seemed like. And, and this was a hybrid poplar plantation. It was four years old, 60 feet tall, and about 10 inch, eight, eight inches in diameter, just, just phenomenal. And in contrast to that, there's my, my picture uh, side by side showing this very shallow, very thin, barely thin A horizon on top of bedrock and so frost shattered bedrock in, in Pennsylvania. And, and immediately you get the, the sense that there's some big differences in soils. And, and so from here to there and, and everything. And so we really need to start thinking and looking deeply about carbon if we're thinking about these pools. So what I want to do today that I'd like to talk about, start out with soil carbon and, and uh, then I'd like to talk about organic matter and, and why it matters. And, and then I'd like to talk a bit more about the carbon and specific part of that organic matter. And I talk about particularly pools and fluxes, the way we conceptualize it and how we think about these carbon pools. And, and I'll talk about controls and constraints. What, what are the, the factors? That, that limit or constrain the amount of carbon in those systems. And, and finally, that'll lead into a little bit of forest management and soil organic carbon. What will set the stage for how much and why, and then we'll talk a little bit about what is the role, if any, of, of management in soil carbon. And so first, thinking about total soil carbon, we can kind of think about, we think about two major pools, the, the organic pool, uh, we call it SOC. I, I just get tired of writing things out. And uh, the inorganic pool, SIC. And, and so the organic pool we're kind of probably more familiar with. It's the beautiful organic matter we see. It ranges from all this material from litter all the way down to highly decomposed humus. And it's, uh, it's throughout the soil in, in most cases. And, and it's dominant. So in human regions where we have a lot of vegetation to to grow things as this material accumulates both above ground and below ground and, and we see it and, and we work with it. 
And, and then on the other hand, there's the other portion, the other part of this pool is the inorganic portion, largely the carbonates. And, and they, they are part of the secondary minerals and, and they eventually leach out and they're dissolved. And they're really dominant in the arid regions. So where we don't have a lot of leaching and a lot of rainfall, these materials aren't weathered and aren't broken down and they persist. And so carbon in these regions is, is pretty much dominated by the inorganic, the carbonates. But we're focusing now where we have forests. And of course, where we have forests, we have plenty of rainfall. And so we'll focus now on the soil organic carbon, the, the so-called SOC. And thinking about that, so I think about forests and, and the, the castle that, that holds the forest together is the soil. And this is just my little picture of that. And, and the key to that soil in terms of the physical and chemical properties is soil organic matter. So I'll abbreviate that as SOM. And then the currency, how do we account for and, and kind of trade and, and understand and, and inventory organic matter and largely soil organic carbon? So here's my here's my little um, picture of, of how I view things and, and how things relate in a very simple picture. And so let's get down to soil organic matter, SOM. And, and so where does it come from? So of course we have rainfall on plants and so plants and animals grow and, and they grow and they die and they, they become part of the system. And, and so the remains accumulate and, and everything from just raw material all the way to very highly decomposed material. And this, this illustrates that. I hope my, is my cursor showing up there? Yes. Oh, great. So we have, a, this is a typical forest floor. This is some of our work back, back when I was a PhD student looking at impacts of harvesting and ripped in Vermont on a big study with the Forest Service. And it shows the leaf litter and then it starts to get chomped, chomped on by the biota and you can't recognize it as individual pieces. And then eventually you get this very highly decomposed, resynthesized material of humus. So this varying states of decay. And then, then it's even older. So down here, that, that highly decomposed material gets intricately mixed and tied up with the clay and silt material. And, and so it's, just, it's all the way from highly undecomposed to very decomposed and synthesized. And so what's the central role of this? So this, this organic matter, usually it's not a great deal. If you look at a soil profile or in, even in the top A horizon, it might be five, six, 7% of the, the volume. Uh, but but it's it's its importance it just is blown away relative to its volume. It's it's this organic matter. It's at the heart of the physical and chemical properties of the soil, the very center of what's going on. And, and so considering that, we, how what does that mean for us? Uh, it's the foundation of ecosystem services, right? And so these ecosystem services benefits from resources and processes provided by ecosystems, and, and they're categorized in number and. It, in the past, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't think about this and much to our dismay and to the degradation of systems. But as, as people became more aware, we started, well, they have some kind of value. And the big, big effort now is to try to put some kind of value on these. So things like we have provisioning services, the things that we buy, food and water and fiber. But, the, but it's not all that. They're regulating services, climate is regulated, water, pollution pollination, disease is regulated. This is a, a picture of a story of a, a, rift, a rift Valley fever. It's a viral zoonosis, it affects animals, but it's very much, um, it's very much impacted by mosquitoes. And so that's affected by climate. And then we have ecosystem services that are supporting during soil formation and, and nutrient cycling. And this is one of my favorite pictures up at um up at Wanakina, up near Wanakina and in, in Star Lake. And this is on this this old mine where they've blown in all this old material, the old JNL mines, and primary succession beginning again. And on this, we're seeing the development of soil and nutrient cycle. And then, of course, we have this cultural services are the things that we appreciate and, and for education and aesthetics, and our heritage, and, and even so much of some of our old foundations and buildings. Uh, these are very valuable to us for recreation and tourism. And so organic matter is kind of at the heart of these, these functions. And so we, we now, I, I hope I've induced you to think about soil organic matter is valuable and, and how to try to talk about how do we account for it and, and how do we deal with it in terms of measurement and inventory. And pretty much it's soil organic carbon. And organic carbon roughly <clears throat> is about half of soil organic matter. And, and that's a, that holds pretty, pretty wide for most of our soil organic matter. 
And, and so where does carbon come from? Well, the carbon's coming from all this material. It's coming from above ground, right? We have this is a picture of some of our work at Weymouth Point, Maine, which I'll mention later. And we, we collect the litter, we measure it, and, and we measure this input and get an idea of what the inputs are. It comes from roots and below ground. All these roots are growing continuously and pushing out carbon below ground. So while we're really familiar with the above ground, the annual rain of needles and and hardwood litter and also branches and so forth, we generally don't think about this annual rain of pushed out carbon from the roots, all these exudates as these roots cohorts grow and, and die. It's, it's an amazing, so as much as we're seeing carbon up top, we have as much below ground. So we generally think about this as young carbon. It's fairly young. It's, it's just fairly young deposited and labile. Most of that, a lot of good portion of that is very easy for the organisms to, to chew and, and, and utilize. And then we get down into this old carbon, this intricately mixed with the soil and, and, and the soil profile and clays. And we tend to think about that as recalcitrant, being resistant and being very old. And, and more recently, we've begun to think about how that cycles. And this is a picture out of a paper by Francesca Couturefro's group, looking and they study decomposition. And this is actually from some grassland data, but they study what happens as this soil material, this organic material hits the ground and eventually goes from organic, very labile material to, to very old and synthesized material. And, and the losses, so we have these, we have non-structural uh, sugars and so forth. They're really easily used. And we have cellulose, which is a little more uh, resistant and hemicelluloses. And then we have these, these very highly indecomposable and resistant materials. And they they go up and down. And, and the easy stuff, the label stuff is leached out and it heads down and it's dissolved organic matter. And that begins to form stabilized organic matter deeper in the profile. At the same time, some of this particulate organic matter also goes down physically. So there's a real interesting story and in understanding developing about how these cycle, and it's a little more complex than what we originally thought. So what can I, if I would say one word that would capture soil organic matter after I just talked about this, this amazing bit of cycling and its, its variability, and I would say it's dynamic. Uh, and it's dynamic in two ways. We think about spatially and spatially very dynamic just from place to place, just through the topography and micro topography, but also temporally. And that last slide I showed kind of illustrating the, the dynamics of organic matter and cycling showed its temporal dynamics. And so we put those two things together and, and we realize or kind of present the idea that carbon moves around its cycles. And, and this, this kind of sets a foundation for us to understand how we might view management is, is what's happening with carbon. How does it cycle? How does it move around? And what's what's the controlling? What are the controlling factors? So, so if we're going to understand management impacts on soil carbon, I'll start back with, with that kind of introduction. We can kind of think about conceptually the pools, these conceptual pools of how we think about carbon. And we think about how large these pools are, the relative sizes and how we define the relative characteristics. And so what is the largest terrestrial pool of carbon? Well, it's the soil, right? It's the soil. It, it just dwarfs the vegetation by several fold, okay? And all that dwarfs what's in the atmosphere. So this is a big pool, okay? And so if we think about terrestrial on the, on the globe, soil is the major pool. Vegetation lines up a, a a distant second, okay, which is close to the atmosphere. And, and we think about that pool. So I mentioned the organic matter and carbonates. And so over the globe, about 3,000 petrograms are soil organic matter, three quarters of it, and about 1,000 carbonates. Okay. So organic matter dominates. And of course, this is true in where we have plenty of rainfall, but less true. And so it kind of flips around in the arid regions. But we're talking about forests and trees. So we'll think about this, um, these wetter regions. Okay. So what do I think about the soil? It's the, it's the Fort Knox for organic carbon. And it, here's a picture of, of, of thinking about that. And, but there are other pools and, and we get into oceans and lakes and there's the carbonates in these systems, very large. You know? And so this even dwarfs soil, but this, these are kind of 
um, definitely not terrestrial. And then we have rocks, carbonate rocks. And there, there's the big pool. And that's relatively stable. Of course, these are all weather and so forth. But here's the dynamic pool, this organic carbon. This is an interesting graph. I'll send it to you. Don't stand there on over my food. Pardon me? Sorry oh, about that. Oh, sorry. I was okay. So so thinking about that. So we're on scales. We're, we're on different scales from micro scale to macro scale. And we think about these scales. We have the molecule. We have the people that study this in PEDs and pores at the at the soil physics level. And then we have pet on at the soil pet on or at the lands, a little less than landscape. We talk about soil series and soil families. Then we look at those pedons and we look at landscapes and how soils are distributed. So we have subgroups and great groups. And then we go to the larger eco regions and we get to these order and suborders. And then we get the biomes and continental scale. So we're thinking about this on a variety of scales. And I just, I'll just keep that in mind. Now, a lot of these, so a colleague of mine, Luke Nave, has a really several nice publications that kind of looks about carbon management. So I've drawn a lot of this from his work. And so the variables controlling it. So here we have these various scales and now we're getting down to what's constraining soil organic carbon stocks across these different scales. And so the, the first thing we think about is climate, right? So climate, temperature, precipitation, these are the big drivers. They're driving the vegetation. They're also driving the decomposition. They're the drivers of pretty much how much material, how much carbon you can fit into a system. One of the big drivers. And this again, across a global scale. And, and how do we think about that further? We think about, you can combine temperature and precipitation and think about potential evapotranspiration, abbreviated PET. So this is the amount of water that would be transpirated should there be no resistance to soil. So it's largely temperature driven. And when you get it down to actual evapotranspiration, the temperature comes in and has an effect based on water movement. But so PET is we think about combining temperature and precipitation as a pretty good index for climate. And, and so we can kind of blow that up and think about what, how does that fit in terms of our, our holdage life zones. These are, these are zones based on vegetation where vegetation grows and it's been organized and it has several axes. We think about on one side, we think about the precipitation. So we go from low precipitation to high precipitation in millimeters. And then on the other side, we think about the bio temperature, um, really cold regions, really warm regions. Okay. And so we have the really cold regions, the polar regions, subpolar, and, and we can arrange vegetation and soils in this kind of a, this kind of a relationship. And the, these, these Holdridge life zones are quite useful for that. And we can also superimpose on that the potential evapotranspiration ratio. That is the ratio of potential evapotranspiration to precipitation. And here it is filled out a little further. Here are these life zones. We've got the deserts, polar deserts, going all the way, all the way down to the warm, hot deserts and everything in between. And then here's this ratio of one. So this suggests that the potential evapotranspiration is the same as precipitation. Okay. So as you get higher potential evapotranspiration, it goes up here and it gets rather rather wet. Okay. And as you get as you, as it gets more and more, it gets very wet and very dry. So this is a nice way to look at look at um, climate kind of in one sleek, sleek little ratio, the PET ratio. So everything, as you get up to this way, you're getting to very little evapotranspiration relative to precipitation, okay? Very moist. And if you have a lot of potential evapotranspiration relative to precip, the demand exceeds the supply, you start to get very dry. And so we can kind of superimpose, and this is actually, I didn't know we, this was done by Post and others in the classic paper in 82, the density of carbon the soil organic carbon in the mineral soil to a depth of one meter and based on these PET lines. And so that those line up. So you get a lot of carbon production where there's a lot of moisture in relative to PET and very little 
where there's a lack of moisture. And this is just another way to look at that. So it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, I always think this is a very nice, neat diagram. And so if we can think about that, and it's, uh, it's like real estate, the key to soil carbon, location, location, location. Okay? And, and we think about that on global scales and regional scales. And the global scale, just the regional scale I just showed you, the Holdridge life zones was a, a good illustration of that. And we can think about that as locally. Then we can start to think about the influence of topography and drainage influencing that moisture. And, and to, to put that back into another picture across the globe of what that might look like, taking it out of my triangles. And, and this, is, this is pretty much a fair assessment, a fair of the global ecological zones. This is one of the FAO, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization uses this. And this is actually Luke Nave uses this in his publication, just shows show the differences in the distribution across the globe of these tropics and desert formations and different uh, humid and dry forests. And, and it's uh, so I'm bringing it a little closer to home. This is uh, ecosystem provinces. This is a classification by the USDA Forest Service. Um, it's the ecological land type classification, which I find very useful and very similar. It, it looks at the vegetation and climate and soils and develops these ecological zones. And it's a hierarchical. It goes from provinces all the way down to subzones. And for instance, here's a New England province. There's us up here. Here's our Tug Hill Plateau in New England and the Adirondacks. And that goes further into um, another the higher level of let's say a more fine level where we can look at individual individual components of that. And this is the Adirondack mountain section and the Tug Hill Plateau. So this is another way to kind of view these, uh, these global and regional distributions of vegetation as driven by climate. Okay, so that, that kind of puts this where and location, location. And now we kind of think about what constrains soil organic carbon stocks. And we have the big picture constrained by climate, uh, soil properties, and soil and site properties. And soil texture is figuring big into this. And then topography and drainage class. So these are dominant soil features that constrain the amount of carbon in a system. And um, after we talk all about this, then we can talk about management. And so at first talk about the two higher level tiers and then how does management influence or, or not influence these, these values of carbon, organic matter and carbon. And so with that, I wanna introduce one of the more recent papers by my colleague, Luke Nave. This was a nice meta-analysis. This was done across the lake states. He has several out, one of them Pacific Northwest, but this one's for the lake states. And his title of this, the idea of this, the idea of these meta-analyses was to synthesize all the existing data and studies that have been published and assess land use and management impacts on soil organic carbon in the context of soil and site properties. So here we're getting down to the, uh, kind of taking the same route. Luke takes the same route and starts out with what controls, what are the controlling factors? And then how does management influence soil organic carbon? So what Luke did and his colleagues, they took 39 studies, they went, went to the literature and found studies where they had a control versus treatment and had soil organic carbon data. And this was the lake states, okay, in that, that lake states area in the, in the it's, it's nicely defined in the ecological um, land types for the Forest Service. And it also supplemented that with some other data. So the National Cooperative Soil Survey under NRCS, they store, they collect data from all these soil pedons, and that's stored in Lincoln, Nebraska. We all have access to it. And so he found data from 1,700 locations in that area, and also tapped into some of the USDA forest inventory analysis data. And, and they collect data in the soils. Um, it's, it's fairly rudimentary just by depth, but zero to 10 and 10 to 20 centimeters of soil, along with all their typical FIA plot data. So he utilized those three sources of data and to kind of analyze or understand or ask the question, how does management impact forest soil carbon? 
And, and so he, in looking at that, he's come up with the same kind of conclusions that we have. And now I, I show you those conclusions based on some very specific data for the late states to kind of reinforce those generalizations I just made. Uh, soil properties, texture and taxonomic order. So if, if you're not familiar with soil taxonomy, the first level, the crudest level classification is the order, and they are driven based on climatic factors, based on temperature and precipitation as in controlling factors. And then as they go down to orders, create orders and subgroups, the taxonomy further gets classified by soil properties. And so here's the first result, one of the interesting results from, from Luke's paper. And he has A horizon texture. So based on compiling A horizons, and this is the NRCS data and the FIA data, just to show the impact of soil texture on A horizon soil organic carbon. So this is the upper horizon, the A horizon. And this is carbon, soil organic carbon. And typically we look at it in this megagrams per hectare. So mega 10 to the six, this is a metric ton per hectare. And that's our typical unit for looking at these soil stocks. And we go down from the sands, the loamy sands. And so we increasing clay, increasing fineness. And pretty interestingly, as, as we've many people have shown before and our generalizations have shown before that the soil organic carbon in these A horizons increases with soil clay, with increasing soil fineness. These numbers represent the number of pedons and these are 95% bootstrapped confidence intervals. Okay? So it's, it's pretty clear that sandy soils have very low organic carbon and the finer textured soils have higher organic carbon. And the same is true when you look at the FIA data. Okay? It's not as finely parsed, they don't have every horizon, but they have the upper horizons of zero to 10 centimeter. And it's pretty clear that soil texture improves or is associated with increased organic carbon for the most part. So some of the other sources of variation, now we get down to harvest impacts. And it's interesting, the harvest impacts and that if we, Luke has found and others have found, the greatest changes are usually in the topsoil, that upper, that upper piece of soil, relatively rich in organic matter, where we see the greatest changes due to harvesting. And here are Luke's data summarized. These are these published studies and then taking the NRCS database and the FIA database. And if you look at this, this is the difference between the harvested and the control, the harvested in the dot and the open dot with control and the difference. And next to this difference is the magnitude of it. And then the probability, the statistical significance. And so if we look at these from the O horizon all the way down to the B and C horizons, and then sum the whole profile, looking at the whole profile, these are what we see, where we see a significant reduction in soil organic matter storage, it's always in the A horizon. And it's consistent between all of the work, all of the studies that Luke looked at in this lake state meta-analysis, consistent with the data he had from the NRCS, consistent with the data from the FIA, a reduction ranging from 17 to 20% in the A horizon for soil organic carbon in response to harvest. Interestingly also in the whole profile, no difference. Okay, there's no difference when you look at the whole profile. This difference is pretty much exclusively or focused on the upper soil horizon, the top soil. And so what's going on? And so I, I thought I'd introduce some of the work we had done at Weymouth Point to, to kind of put this in perspective. And so we have a study, we've been working on this study for um, almost 40 years. We reported, just reported out in the last two or three years, and we have a current paper currently under review for modeling. We've reported on 35 year results, post harvest of this paired watershed whole tree harvest study in Weymouth Point, Maine. It's up here in North Central Maine. We started this study in 79, we cut it in 81, and we've been monitoring it ever since. And that, when I was at University of Maine working there, part of my work was up here working on these sites, and which I have a nice connection to the site. So I'm quite proud of that. This, this work was published, uh, we published three papers or two already, and led by Tat Smith. So Tat is a good colleague 
he uh, this was actually his PhD research back in the day, um, some years ago. Uh, and and so uh, let me see if I can leave that whole excuse me just a second. There, I'll try to. Uh, so please, please ignore that. <laughs> I can't figure out how to mute my mute my incoming, but it will only be there, only be there for a second. So, so, so back to this. So this is Weymouth Point. We have a clear cut and harvested watershed. So we have a, a control watershed. And in 1981, we clear cut the adjacent watershed, Hall Street Harvest, and we've been following it with a variety of with a variety of studies uh, since since that time. And so this. What I'll talk about today is what we know 35 years afterward, and have summarized it. We've had these soil plots where we've actually actually done quantitative pit analysis. We have a bunch of these where we, we've measured the actual stocks with concentrations and content, and measured the whole soil. So a pretty a pretty interesting and good database that we've been working on for many many years. And, and so here's one of the one of the primary results of that. So this this is one of the graphs out of that one of many. And so forest floor and mineral soil pool at Weymouth Point. And this is carbon. It's in megagrams per hectare. And, and we have our data. We have the organic soil mixed a little bit of mineral, depending on how much mixing there was. The OAE. And then we had three levels of mineral, three depths, zero to ten centimeters, ten to twenty-five centimeters and 25 to 50 centimeters, and then down into the, the CD, the very dense basal till. So looking at all that, these are these were our treatments. Ref, okay, this was the, the reference watershed, and we had three treatments in that whole tree harvest. We redistributed some of the material, the harvest material, the residues, redistributed that in the plots in lops, just in branches back in 1981. Some of those we chipped and redistributed those, and then the whole tree harvest where we just took everything off. So if we look at the total carbon in the system, pretty much no difference. So this whole profile total carbon, 35 years after this whole tree harvest treatment and putting back residues in various ways, no difference in total carbon. But what we do see a difference is, is in the distribution of that carbon. Okay? So note, this is the OAE. The, dis, the forest floor and uh, this organic material is forest floor and it varies quite a bit in the reference that forest floor still remains quite thick 35 years after. But in the whole tree harvested, it's been reduced almost by half, as much as half and as much as three quarters to a half. And where did that carbon go? Well, it's been redistributed. That carbon has been redistributed in the mineral soil. And how do we know this? We have these quantitative pits where we've tracked this um, pretty exactly in, in these pools. And, and here in the lop and whole tree harvest treatment, we see a major redistribution, a loss up here, redistributed into the mineral soil, okay, compared to the reference. So redistribution. And so now getting back to, uh, to Luke's paper, that, that kind of explains it, 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 it kind of focuses the impact on the system is largely, at least for this Weymouth Point study, a redistribution of carbon rather than a loss. And, and why would we lose it? Well, we expect, you know, the forest floor gets oxidized when you expose it to light and energy, and then you get a lot of decomposition. But with all that cycling, a lot of that material is dissolved, and moves down, and resynthesized, and and moved down to the lower horizons. And this is a, this was a major one of our results. So so again, back to back to Luke's uh, paper now. Soil organic carbon change by texture due to harvest. These are the lake state data. And and if we look at this, okay, the probability is so statistically significant. There is some change. We see our biggest losses, okay, in the coarse texture. Okay, loamy sands, and we see the biggest gains in the heavier textures, more clay. So the distribution is very much affected by soil texture. So soil texture matters. And then another interesting part of this, Luke uh, and colleagues had, had actually looked at cover type and they looked at, they had these studies, the broadleaf versus coniferous. And what is the change in soil organic carbon due to harvesting over the whole profile? And for the broadleaf systems, there was essentially no change. Okay? For the coniferous systems, a big reduction. Okay? And it's interesting that 
in this particular case, for all these coniferous mix, they were on outwash for the most part. And so outwash, of course, textures sandy soils. And so we have the greatest impact. And so this kind of lines up with that idea of parent material. And whereabouts in the profile? So again, back to Luke's study, and this is just not quite significant. It's kind of, we call this marginally significant. But in the O horizon, we see the re biggest reduction. Here's no impact. Okay, here's a negative impact. And then the A horizon, which we've already shown, a reduction. And then E horizon, the leash horizon overlaps, and then nothing. And then actually marginally an increase in the deeper horizons. So again, this kind of suggestive of redistribution, at least on this broad scale, which we demonstrated at Weymouth Point at a single site on a fine scale. And at Weymouth Point were for silt loam soils. And, and so some, some closing comments. Um, it's a, and, and soil and site factors constrain soil organic carbon. And, and as a, I take this quote out of um, Luke's paper, place matters, okay, site matters. And generally, the total profile soil organic carbon is not reduced by harvesting. Topsoil is vulnerable to reduction and outwash more so because of its coarse texture. But part of the take home message for me, at least from our Weymouth point work has been soil carbon is redistributed. So where we expected originally these, these radical losses just due to oxidation, it turns out at least in many cases that this is not such a radical loss to oxidation, but a redistribution, a loss in one horizon and a gain in another. And so with that, I show one of my favorite pictures from Maine. This is at the top of Mount Katahdin one uh, weekend when we had a, a day to hike up and back. And uh, it was a, a marvelous trip. I don't think I, my knees could take that now. But back then, back then in my 40s, it was a, this was an easy trip. And so that, that's, um, that's about all I have to say. And I'd be happy to, to, to talk and address any questions and, and also invite you. So I have a, I, this spring, I teach advanced forest soils. And one of the one of my favorite topics is we cover this spring in that course. It's on the carbon modeling and distribution as we lose litter layers. So that's um, so that's my little plug. So come and take my course. <laughs> and with that, let me uh, let me turn it over to Nancy and and uh, and uh, she can advise me on what what to do next. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Russ. Um, let's see if we have some questions in the. Um, in the chat, I don't think that's a question here. Um, has there been research in pilot study for irrigating forests? Oh, that, that's a really interesting question. And it, it's, it takes me back to my master student days. So that when I was a master student, um, it, this was kind of interesting is that um, Dr. Leaf, who was, who was my first major professor, he had a, uh, he had 15 students and we were all packed in. And, and they were looking, we were doing a lot of work on the pack forest plain, Warrensburg, with all this fertilizer work. But one of the, one of the grad students had done a, set up this huge, so this is an outwash plain, right? It's very, it's potassium deficient, a, a huge place for sea fertilizer response. One of the first places in the, in the United States we've documented response to potassium fertilizer. And this, this is a, and if, if, of course, if you're going to irrigate, you want to irrigate something that makes sense. You want to irrigate something that has no water holding capacity. So they, they set up this huge experiment, which was was quite a difficulty back then. And you, wouldn't you know it, they hit a wet year two years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was it was kind of this it, it was um, kind of funny, but not funny. But that's uh, that's how it goes with field research sometimes. But the, so the irrigation uh, in general. Little work has been done, and most most of the work on irrigation really is focused on the um, the intensive programs with hybrid poplar and willow, uh, and, and so for the most part, um, that's usually usually not a, the most important driver. I, I will make a statement in the southeast with southern pines, um, a lot of work had been done thinking about um, full lim limiting or eliminating all constraints, and irrigation was part of that. And it turned out that irrigation in that system, those were done at the NC uh, North Carolina State Fertilizer Co-op, really didn't really didn't um, do much. And the big drivers there tended to be more the um, more 
phosphorus, which so is interesting. So, so if, and that's my long way of saying there's not been much thought or work or, or directional need people haven't seen to think about irrigating irrigating forests aside from these very intensive um, these very intensive systems. Good. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, thank you. I really enjoyed that. I was a soil science major in college and I yes. heard a lot of new things. <laughs> High five. Um, <laughs> um, what my question was is when I heard that um, a lot of redistribution comes with the harvest, I couldn't really think of how that might be happening or why it doesn't happen without the harvest. Oh yeah, great, great question. So, so when you, all of a sudden, when you, um, you know, let's say we we clear this off, and now we we've, we've got this this porous floor exposed to a tremendous amount of light and moisture. Okay? So, so all of a sudden, the the flora, the the um, the biota, they really jump to work. They start chewing things apart, and the, their populations get large. The everybody expands, and they start chewing it up. And, and so, at that point, some of it's on. You get this particulate matter. And it tends to migrate downward. And so the first thing, so you have a lot of um, leaching. So a lot of material gets leached. So water carries much of this downward. It dissolves, you know, organic carbon dissolves and everything else dissolves and starts to go downward. Now it goes downward, but it's, it, it's picked up. It's let's say it, it's picked up in the, the B horizon. Where where the um, where you have alluvation, so that material is picked up and starts to combine, and so now this material moving downward tends to be incorporated and resynthesized into this humus mass. And so while there is loss of oxidation, the carbon is respired to the atmosphere. There's a bit of movement downward, and, and so that after a year or two uh, or three, that and the the leaf area index comes back. That 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 environment changes drastically. And so while it is very drastic and you do get this oxidative loss, it's not quite as large as you would think. It's it's rather, um, it's almost this, this sudden episode. And, and I liken it to, we studied the, we studied the movement of nutrients in, in these systems. And at, right here at Weymouth Point, the study I described, and the first three years after harvest, we wash the system with soluble nutrients. Nitrate just, just went to the root. But when we blew that up and it, it kind of dissipated after four years, and after four years, as the leaf area returned and evapotranspiration and uptake returned, that was kind of shut off. So we get this pulse of a nitrogen loss and other losses that was rapidly attenuated by the vegetation. And I think so it is with the organic carbon. We get that, that pulse and oxidation uh, as, as material is respired, but that cools after a sh relatively short period, a few years, and, and then we bring back that, that, that cover to kind of slow that process down. Meanwhile, the movement material downward is some of that's being captured and resynthesized. So this, this recent work by, by Francesca Catrufo's group kind of uses, um, they use, um, uh, hmm, word I'm searching for. They, they use isotopes to kind of follow this and, and study the cycling of this organic matter and, and see that our old idea of labile and recalcitrant missed a large piece of the movement and cycling back and forth. And so that's the that's the exciting piece of what's happened now. And, and another caveat to that is forest floors do disappear. They disappear rapidly. Okay. But that is not the whole part of the profile. It's the upper surface. And in the famous paper years ago, was the Covington curve. We get this huge dip as the forest floor and it takes this time to recover. And it turned out that a lot of that was due to harvesting and mixing. So, so Ruth and I, one of my other colleagues had a neat paper on that showing that it was more, more of that was due to the way that those sites were characterized than an actual one site over time. So some interesting nuances to that. That's a great question. Um, thank you. That helped a lot. And just out of curiosity, is there much difference between the Pacific Northwest where I live and the East Coast where you're describing? Yeah, that, that's another interesting question. So the Pacific Northwest, so I haven't fully read Luke's paper, but these these trends, 
these trends follow, but I haven't I haven't followed that closely enough. But Luke just that paper is just out about um, in the last year or two down the Pacific Northwest, and I I can recommend that. I, I haven't looked in detail to know all the nuances of that yet. Thank you. Great. Okay, so um, Greg had his hand up and now has a question in the uh, chat. So. Will you elaborate on organic soil versus mineral soils and whether a common definition exists or if it even matters? Oh man, that while well, you're you're asking questions that we kind of butt heads butt heads about all the time as we think about classification. Yeah, so so the classification first, let's do mineral versus organic. Right? So so the cutoff for this for, for many years ago was was 20% organic carbon. So that we're going to say that everything less than 20% organic carbon is going to be mineral material, everything greater than 20% organic. And that had a sliding scale. That had a sliding scale that went up or down depending on the clay composition. So about four or five years ago, the taxonomy folks argued that this was, it wasn't helping much and that we should just cut it off at 12%, that that sliding scale wasn't very useful. And, and so that's close to where we are today. So that, I think that's right now is my, and I, as I teach my classes, I, I really like that 12% because it eliminates the nuances of having to slide up or down based on clay content. And so I it kind of, at that, so I don't know whether it matters at 12% or 14%, but the difference, the big difference between organic soils and mineral soils largely is inundation, right? So all of our organic soils are there because they were, they accumulated faster than they decompose. And that was because they're in anaerobic environments. So you're in a low spot in the landscape, all water. So remove the water and all of a sudden you start to see that, that decline in the organic carbon for a couple of reasons. And one of those, when you remove that water, that carbon, it's a, you remove the support system, it compresses. So you get this compression. So there's no real change in the amount, okay? but you increase the oxidation. So over time, organic soils are they're more rapidly oxidized, particularly if you start farming them. So, so those do matter, but then we think more, mostly I think most of the management issues I see on those are largely on the organic farm, the ag side, rather than rather than forest soil side. Because in forest soil side, we're usually not draining them. Okay. Well, I think a case, a case where we were drained back years ago before Clean Water Act, and we used to drain the in the uh, southeastern U.S., those those lower wetlands, right, and that was great pine. So you you give the pine a little bit of 50 centimeters, 25, 50 centimeters of aerated zone, boom, you've got a, a fabulous production. But and that that was done a lot, and so those are no longer allowed to be drained, right? So so that relative to um, to forest management in old days it made some difference. But the other and the other piece of that, is, and I throw this out, I just thought of it. The other piece of that is controlling the aerated zone. So when organic farming systems, organic soils, let's separate that from organic farm systems, organic soils, they're really controlling the length of the of the aerated zone in terms of its its um its length in growing season. What they don't want is just bring the water table down and leave it down because once the growing season ceases, that advantage for aeration stops and just you continue to blow away the soil, not blow it away, but let's say um, um, it would decompose rapidly. So the management of organic soil farms, not organic farms, but organic soil farms has to do with control of the water table and bring it right back up as soon as the growing season is over to minimize not only minimize loss in oxidation, but to minimize that loss associated with with a blowing, because these soils are very subject to wind erosion. Does that answer the question? I guess it does. Um, so, does migration of uh, SOC? down in the soil profile affect ecosystem services? Well, I, I would, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know to the degree I, I thought about that or measured it. Um, if it's there, it just may shift where things happen. I, that's a really good question. I have to think more in depth. I just can't come up with a flip answer to that. That's, I'd have to think about that for a while. Good. I, because there are a number of pieces of that. And one is, 
where the particular ecosystem service is function is it is it function mostly at the surface is it more a depth side i'd have to think about that for a bit that's and i just can't give a quick answer as much as i'd like to <laughs> well understandable okay so where do you draw the line between labile and recalcitrant what well, time frame yeah and so do you consider biochar biochar is truly recalcitrant in terms of remaining in the soil for hundreds of years yeah yeah so I, I i usually think about you know one or two years for labile that and just uh and that's just a, a generalization that that sticks in my head because we've always in the soils text we've always seen that one to two year half-life of fairly fast cycling i don't know that i could put it down to a day or or a week or a month but i think it's, it's in that relative time scale and then we get to the the, the middle time scales uh, of, um, you know, decades and then thousands of years, millennia for the longer time scales. Actually, uh, years ago, uh, well, in the uh, 20, I don't know, around 08 or 05, I had a, a PhD student that looked at the, the amount of organic matter associated with different size fractions. So we had this, this Willow study, and it still goes on. But we were, we were wondering about how, it, how sustainable it is and, and where all the organic carbon is. And, and we know that organic carbon is associated with particle size. And so these fine clays, these small particles, they intricately, um, they intricately absorb and, 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 um, and group with organic matter into these, these aggregates. And so they're very protective and they last a long time. And those, we think about that as a very long life, very long half-life. It's there for a long time because it's protected. It's not easily available to most microbes. And we actually actually looked at that and and um, measured the organic carbon associated with clays and then sands and silt size, and and the the most of that material was in the silt size clay size material as opposed to the sands, but I that was um that's just the little pieces I remember from that it was like a, a long time ago, but it's um. It, it, it's kind of associated, the size distribution also associated with this idea of recalcitrant or not recalcitrant because it's protected or, or less protected. And then we get to the large particle we call now POM, particulate organic matter, the large sizes that are relatively easily decomposed and available to most organisms. Okay. So Daniel, do you want to, um, good, ask your question? I saw you unmuted. Is it a problem with your headset? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. No, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, is there any way that uh, soil carbon can be increased in forests that you're aware of, and it, um, or is it a question of just in, in terms of the amount of soil that's stored in the car in the forest? Is that just going to be the how mature the forest is? Yeah, I think, I think that there's two answers. There's kind of yes to both. Right? You you can add we add um we can add organic material. We can add mulches and compost. So that that compost will will eventually decompose. But we can add those. We can add biochar. People have been people are now working on the biochar question, how much and and what it does. And and so it has it's turned out not to be a panacea. But this is a this is an active question right now. People people are actually working on. Um, I neglected to get into the biochar work because I was too busy with other work, but I have a bunch of colleagues that are that that are pretty uh, pretty stoked about it. Um, so to, I, I just got off on a tangent. Can you remind me? Can you put me back into where I'm going? Uh, yeah, I was just. Uh, um, uh, uh, is there a way of increasing um, uh, carbon in in the forest overall? Is that something that will will change? I guess with the how how mature the forest is. Um, so if you're trying to be in, in, to increase the amount of carbon that's stored in an ecosystem, is there any? What, what's the best way of doing that? I guess would be the yeah, uh, yeah. question. So I think it, it might be futile in, in the forest systems, right? Because you have this continual cycling. And, and I don't know that. So then the question is the real, I think the real focus on this question is in the ag and agroforestry systems, right? Because okay. and, and ag systems are notorious because, because they've been um, plowed and so forth. They've been, they've lost about half their carbon in the topsoil and, and just oxidized. And, and so now there's a, Big movement in ag to kind of put more 
carbon back into those soils where you see the biggest relative change. Uh, and some of that's starting to be referred to as regenerative agriculture. We're actually starting to think of some of the biological aspects and that that's kind of fascinating. And, and along with that goes all these, these unproven claims about buy this product because it will, it will boost it and that, it, you know, you'll have some, some magical organism you can put on. So that's, and, and so people are starting to think about that a lot. The Soil Health yeah. Institute is, is yeah. starting to wrap with that. They're a group of scientists uh, that are- Yeah, better. We, we've been looking at that for quite a while. <laughs> it's forests that are new to us. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting out of my, I should stay in my lane. <laughs> uh, well, you know, actually, it's relevant to, to mention because it's like we need to know where where to focus, really, mm -hmm. and uh, and and how much can be done in, in, in each area. So, well, well, that's interesting, too, because I, we also I'm involved now with the Nature Conservancy group. Um, we're looking at agroforestry and the sequestration of carbon. So we're, we're actually pulling together this monster database. We've been doing it for about a year and a half. I've got about there are about a dozen or more of us working on it, mining the literature, trying to come up with the uh, numbers to associate with various agroforestry systems. And, and so that that's very much active and we'll probably get a, we hope to get that published in the, in the coming year, but that's, um we're going great guns on that right now. And so the agroforestry question is very, very interesting to me. Okay, great. Um, Kristen has asked, what about, uh, SOC effect of harvesting conifers affected by drought. Well, that, that's a um, great question. I, like I, the I, Rocky Mountain area. Yeah, yeah. No, because I, I actually did some work with a, with a Nature Conservancy colleague on, on pine beetle infestation mm -hmm. and, and fire. And, and, uh, and the big driver there, uh, the weather, right? The, the moisture regime and in terms of, so harvesting conifers, I think that's, um, that becomes, I don't know if that's going to do much in terms of this, what, what that's going to have effect on soil organic matter, because the, I think the bigger risk for that system is fire. And, and so, of course, a catastrophic fire, it means it's gone. Right? And, and so that's going to be, so I think that's, um, before I worry about increasing the carbon out there, I'd worry, I'd worry mostly about the potential for catastrophic loss and getting the, getting the biomass a little lower. So that's, that's a really interesting question because the, the combination of, of a beetle kill and fire has been, um, has been a disaster. Okay, great. One last question. Can I ask, what does that mean getting the biomass lower? Oh, so, so for instance, so a big part of these systems has been the exclusion of fire. And, and so these are systems, they, these are fire systems. So when fire was excluded, the density of these became unrealistically or uncharacteristically high for those ecosystems. Mm -hmm. and, and so then the combination of that and reduced precipitation, increased evapotranspiration, that led to a fuel load that was just, once that, if that's, if that got sparked, it would be, it would be disastrous. And it has been in many cases. The, the latest idea for that is to come back to bringing prescribed fire back on those landscapes, reducing the density and getting back to what it looked like before this, um, the, the, the so-called out by five policy of the Forest Service, which was, was wonderful then, but unreal, unrealizing, not realizing the negative impacts it had in the system that was somewhat dry to begin with. Great. Um, do you follow and characterize soil biota relative to the capacity of soil carbon to increase? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah no, usually we, we characterize biota just by what they do, right? We, we think about more as the biota and we maybe attach the, we, not the, the carbon driving the biota, but the biota driving the carbon. So it, so I think I look at it from from the other way um, that, that the the biota are pretty much constrained by the by the physical characteristics, the temperature and the moisture. Okay, and, and those things drive the. I think those are the drivers for the biota, their populations and so forth, rather than the um, the, the reverse. But it's, it might be chicken and egg, right? Because they're, they're so intricately related because the biota are surviving based on processing the carbon, which depends on the biota. So I, I don't know where, where I might jump into that circle. I, I may jump in at the wrong spot. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem with cycles. Uh, 
Okay, well, um, I think that's it. And we are 12.59. So <laughs> I want to thank Russ very much for, for talking with us and, and talking about soil carbon in, in uh, forests. Um, now, this was the carbon in underground. Um, and there's a lot of, of carbon in the trees as well. So <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But, but that it's dwarfed by the below ground. Yep. That's and true. It, and we have I have colleagues working on this. So Colin Beyer and uh the, the Caffrey Institute here, they're working on that and trying to model it. They're looking at the combining the uh, FIA data and LIDAR data to come up with good landscape numbers for carbon distributed above ground. So that that's very much active here too at ESF with some some pretty impressive colleagues. Great. So thank you again so much um, for, for taking time to tell us about so, uh, carbon in soil in forest land. Thanks um, for listening. Now that all my kids are old and graduated, and I don't have anybody <laughs> to say, Dad, cut it out. <laughs> it was great. I learned a lot. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So. Without further ado, I will turn off the recording. <laughs>